Can you hear me now? Hey. Hello. Do you hear me? Yay. Okay. Second. One second. Okay. Sure. Hello, everyone. I'm Milos. I'm coming from University of Belgrade. And today I'm going to do a workshop uh, entitled International Institutions. It's going to be divided into specifically three parts, which are going to deal with economy, trade blocks and financial institutions, geopolitics a little bit, and then international justice. So what this is not going to cover in as much detail because I think it's fitted into some other uh, lecture. First of all, I'm not going to talk much about military unions like NATO, uh, because I think they're more fit in international relations lectures, and also they've been done previously from what I know. Also, what I'm not going to do is talk in depth about European Union, specifically because it's a large topic and requires much, much more time. And also, I think it was previously also done in, in, in previous exercises. So now I'm going to cover mostly the things that are not as much covered, like Eurasian Union, uh, ASEAN, and other like uh, international institutions that are not well known uh, by the debating circle. Uh, and that's basically it. So what I want you to do is, if you have any questions, you can ask them in. The comments i think i will be able to see them like currently there is nothing there but like probably there will be uh, i've come to the understanding that this lecture is to be maximum of two hours which means i have to keep some topics shorter than i would necessarily like to because i think it's a very broad topic that i'm going to cover it today so in turn if i sometimes oversimplify stuff or leave stuff out it's because either i think it's unnecessary for you to win the debate or i do not have time and obviously lots of these concepts a lot of these institutions have like you can you can do whole like two hour lectures on either either each one of them and we don't have the time currently and you don't have the time because you're prepping for euros and you have to prioritize so let's then start with international trade and specifically then start with the WTO and yeah so WTO is the World Trade Organization is every, as most of you probably know so it encompasses 164 countries currently and 23 observer countries which and like lots of countries are in uh, the process of getting in there for example Serbia is not yet in the WTO so what is the main purpose of like and where the WTO has the main how do you say um, points and where the debates come up is specifically like trade agreements facilitating more trade agreements between the countries but also this uh, dispute resolutions when you have the trade dispute when you uh, like somebody increases uh, tariffs or something like that you go to the WTO uh, and you have your uh, dispute settled there or something like that. So there are few problematic aspects and two main that come up in the debates oftentimes. So one is the relation between WTO and the developing world and them does free trade and uh, being member of WTO actually facilitates growth or does it ruins some industry in, in these countries? And secondly, uh, 
current status uh, of possible trade war happening with Trump. Not possible, like it's a bit escalating, but like hopefully it, it will not as much. So let, let's go from the second point because there is not much things to be talked here because it's everything is in the future. The problematic thing about all international institutions is that they're necessarily based upon like willingness of countries to cooperate. And if somebody can basically come up and do not respect the rules, there are mechanisms to stop them. But if that country is United States of America, or if it's like specifically United States of America, which is that big, uh, there isn't necessarily a mechanism to punish and to control what they're doing currently in the status quo. And that's why like World Trade Organization was issuing like, oh, keeping calm about uh, trade tariffs and trade barriers imposed by Trump. But there is not much of the stuff that they can do. They can probably fine uh, or, or do something like that, but it also risks him overreacting in a, in, in a different area, measures and maybe even escalating tariffs. So the current situation with President Trump and he's and not, not anti-trade and tariff policies. Uh, it's necessarily very risky for WTO to respond in a certain way. You've seen what he did with, like how do you say, um, uh, Canadian pr pr Prime Minister Justin Trudeau and like how he gets personal and pissed off about these sort of things. So the current situation is very uh, unknowable and unstable, and there isn't much that they can that that can be done. The point is that it's in the actors that are in, uh, how do you say, the conflicts, for example, European Union, China, uh, Canada, Mexico, to probably maybe de-escalate the situation and start working towards a solution. But the WTO and the way that it can do currently, cur they currently lack the ability to do anything. So what they can do, and might be able to do is maybe uh, do some sort of sanctions on U.S. breaking because like U.S. with imposing this amount of tariffs and increasing some of that, they are breaking the rules of WTO, which is first of all, like like lowering, like uh, unnecessary, unreasonably uh, increasing the tariffs. Uh, this is enforced and it's very unlikely for that to happen. And secondly, you can suspend the rights and suspend the membership of, of a nation. That's also unlikely, given that it can maybe even escalate the situation. So I'm not sure how relevant it is. Currently, there might be topics and debates coming up, but they're not, not necessarily from the perspective of WTO and more from the perspective of the individual actors through the European Union de-escalate the tensions or not. So where it's more like prevalent and where we already saw a couple of debates happening is WTO versus the developing world and how does that work? So countries have a lot of uh, benefits from being in the WTO. First of all, like uh, uh, just by uh, being able to do, to do that dispute resolution from a supranational body where everybody's watching, where it should be impartial, something that they have a lot of. Um, a lot more negotiability than they would have just approaching by themselves with these big actors or something like that. So it, it makes the developing countries better in terms of that they can access these uh, like bilateral and multilateral uh, trade agreements way easier on their side of the house. What the problematic thing is, is that WTO hasn't done enough in order to uh, address the issues that that developing countries have. So it's pushing free trade agenda, even on countries and even in the situation where it's not necessarily that smart smart of a thing to do. Uh, and this, these are the main criticisms that I'm going to be talking about right now. So the current debates that happened is specifically last, uh, last Euro's debate that was this house believes that uh, WTO should allow developing countries to impose policies aimed at protecting domestic industries, even at the expense of harming international trade. So it's basic debate, like, like you know, on, on this platform, you already had a lot of, uh, you already had a lecture about developmental economics, why protectionism and maybe sometimes can be good. So let me reiterate some of the, some of the things. So sometimes when the industry is young, the, just the sheer technical superiority of foreign, how do you say, corporations is somewhat uh, bad for the competition that is impossible at the current state of the industry, uh, specifically in some resource extraction or something like that. So 
in fact, if the market opens in some some, some countries and under circum certain circumstances, it risks the industry getting destroyed by international capital and by somebody being on such a high developmental uh, level that uh, the local companies cannot compete. So sometimes in order to facilitate like some industries growing, it is maybe okay to have some protectionist policy, increase some tariffs uh, on, on some industry textile or um, industrial produce that you want to that you want to produce uh, under under certain mechanism. Specifically, if you want to fight like multinational corporations that are notorious for maybe lowering the standards of labor or lowering the environmental protection or something like that so in order to compete with them it's sometimes useful maybe to have a protectionist measure and this is what this debate is usually and clearly emphasizing mm. the problematic thing and what the critics critics of the wto say is that free trade is imposed on these nations while it's not simultaneously imposed as much on the rich countries and the developing nation especially in few uh, how do you say um few regards so for example european union is still allowed to have some sort of tariffs to to an external trade um, uh, trade partners or something like that, specifically because they have a lot of leverage power whilst other small countries do not have that leverage power so if they want to join wto and if they want to negotiate tariffs they are forced to lower themselves to a, to a minimum whilst the rich countries with their leverage power can still maintain the higher tariff rates so the wto is having this somewhat of a double standard in that but also like countries even when when these things have been decreasing and they have been decreasing the tariffs of european union and every other uh, like a, a rich country uh, the problematic thing is circumventing these uh, anti tariff how do you say policies by stuff like uh, implementing and filing for a lot of anti-dumping anti-dumping measures or something like that so basically anti-dumping is if you are fearing that a country is just because they cannot sell like for example if china produces some uh, i don't know uh, some things in their country and they can sell uh, the, the the amount that they intended they can in order for for them to make any profit out of that they can dump that the sort of amount that is left on a country and like slash its price by half or some like which where where it makes it non-competitive to other uh, industries uh, the fear of that is that if it's done for a prolonged period of time uh, it influences and it takes the competitors out of the market that cannot compete with that lower amount of price for example like the problematic thing is that specifically for example european union is overusing this measure in terms of just battling low prices and efficiency that is coming from some countries in the developing world mainly china or something like that so they are using this mechanism and lobby power that they have in order to keep this anti-dumping measure in order for to cushion their own industries and to cushion their own how do you say uh, industries that are not that efficient uh, just by claiming that these are not the real prices and this is not uh, real efficiency is just China dumping stuff on us and this is where currently the majority of trade disputes are in the WTO between China and the European Union about that which is an interesting way to circumvent this uh, to circumvent the competition or something like that. second thing or a third thing okay <laughs> third thing uh, is in particular, uh, intellectual property laws uh, that are viewed as like that, that you're forced to sign up to. So TRIPS uh, is an uh, international agreement where you, wh when you're entering the WTO, you have to sign that you're going to abide by the international property, uh, intellectual property laws uh, and something like that. So, so what is viewed is that intellectual property laws are very, very uh, much constraining the development of developing countries who are already in the disadvantaged position because lots of intellectual property is being uh, and intellectual property claims and patents are being done in the west and in the rich countries which necessarily had the extra money from stuff like colonialism i don't know or other awful stuff that they did in the past in order for now to not just develop 
better uh, and have a developed economy, but also invest in the future patents and making money from intellectual property or something like that. So just by them accessing WTO and having to abide by some of these uh, some of these rules and like having um, this imposed on them is somewhat uh, hampering their technological development and hampering their efficiency and their competitiveness. If you're large enough, you can also circumvent this. China is already circumventing this, but that's the point. That's the, the imbalance that stays in the WTO, in which, like, if you're large enough, uh, international law applies to you to a certain extent, but not really. And if you're small, everything is imposed on you. And this is what lots of countries, a lot of people, when they are criticizing uh, the WTO, are saying. Because the fourthly uh, is the fact that WTO uh, still allows and like there is still a large amount of agricultural subsidies happening in the rich world, specifically the United States and the European Union are the most notorious for having like a lo lots of loads of agricultural subsidies. What does that mean? And, and also these agricultural subsidies aren't necessarily banned or are impossible by the fact that they do not have as much money for the developing world. This means that like agricultural produce that is happening in the like I don't know European Union is way like cheaper to produce and like more competitive than it should be uh, with the agricultural produce of the developing world. Given the fact that the majority of the developing world is currently working in the agricultural sector, this is something that. Uh, targets them very much, and this is why lots of people are protesting stuff uh, that WTO is saying. Specifically, uh, in Latin America and in Africa, uh, the fact that uh, agricultural subsidies are allowed from the, from the, from the Western, uh, uh, from the Europe, in the European Union and the United States and not allowed in, in their countries is something that is viewed as highly unjust and awful, and it leads to bad stuff and like being them not being able to compete with, on the global market w with the prices that are heavily subsidized. And lastly, the problematic thing that is being criticized by the WTO, which also can be maybe a motion or something like that, is that WTO is not dealing with uh, stuff that comes as a byproduct of trade agreements and stuff like that. And this is specifically harms on the environment and the labor standards and labor regulations. So just by the fact that some countries have the, the, like less power than other countries, some countries have less power than multinational corporations or something like that, means that uh, when true free trade opens up and like these standards open up, these also this also usually comes uh, like brings with it the lowering of environmental standards and labor regulations. And there has been a push in the like next how do you say uh, in, in in the past few years. Uh, of actually including uh, maybe common environmental and common labor policy. I would say that maybe it's not the place and time to do so in World Trade Organization, but it's something that needs to be considered specifically with uh, like actual basic safety and health standards, uh, uh, health standards of some members of the WTO that are awful and that leads to human suffering and human indignity or something like that. This is something that can, and like uh, on a basic level, there is something that can be done. The problematic thing again, like with every international institution, is that it depends on the willingness of its member to, to do something and to cooperate. And more likely it depends on the willingness of the larger and more powerful members to do something, which is sad, but it's the fact and, and like this is not going probably not going to happen specifically because of me. So this is the, so this is, this is the portion. So usually the debates are not going to happen. Like I've seen like just a couple of them with specifically WTO as being the actor or something like that. The one being uh, this Euros and the other one being in Berlin, WUDC, which you can search. But like usually where can WTO be mentioned as an actor is sometimes not necessarily, uh, not necessarily in, co in the context of uh, them being in a specific actor motion, but specifically, for example, if it's about res re resolving the current trade crisis or uh, 
if it's about trade trade partnership tpp or something like that just them being a trade dispute resolution option and knowing the bad and the good and the pos positive and the negative stuff that comes with it for the developing world and the developed world is somewhat very useful to either bring as an example or bring as a possible additional actor that, that is to be played in the debate for example uh, the debate that happened in Athens is that uh, as china would not retaliate like this house as china would not retaliate uh, towards like American sanctions and I'm not American, American increase in tariffs or something like that. One of the better things that, that can be uh, said about that motion is specifically why they should re retaliate is maybe because it brings them more leverage, it shows them as more strong. So in order for them to prevent people uh, bringing up anti-dumping measures in the WTO uh, against them, bringing some dispute against them that are not necessarily fair, the show of strength dissuade some of these attacks that there might be uh, forced to follow on, on certain measures. So th this is maybe an example of how to use it in that regard. So that's briefly it about WTO because we have to, we have to move on, uh, on on other topics. If you have any questions about it, I'm free to, to, to answer. So uh, second things that I want to talk about before I go into trade blocks is maybe take a detour to uh, from trade and go a little bit into the financial institutions or something like that. And then like we have a good follow-up from trade to geopolitical institutions. Or something like that. So what I want, want to talk about now is specifically IMF, World Bank, BRICS, uh, AIB, and all of these scary abbreviations that if you see in the motion, your people are scared about it. So let's briefly talk about Firstly, international international monetary fund. So it's the, the the actor that comes up more than the WTO. If we talk about uh, when we talk about uh, specific this abbreviation actor. So in what is the IMF? It's the International Monetary Fund is a fund where countries enter their money and they get voting power based on how much money they invest in it. It's a for-profit institution, which a lot of people do not necessarily realize. So they're in it for them to make and make their money back. So they're not a development, development aid institution or anything like that, even though people believe that they should be. Secondly, uh, America, United States is the main actor and with 15% of the voting power there, with veto power there, and necessarily it is Western-centric institution. Uh, what does it do? It lends money uh, to the countries that are in risk of bankruptcy, in the risk of failing, in the risk of their budget being unsustainable. Or so. so it's a lender of last resort, as it's being called. So few problems. I'm not going to bore you with technical stuff. So, so, so a few problems that come up in the base specifically. One is conditionality of IMF loans. So sometimes and usually, not, usually when IMF gives out loans, it requires countries to do as they say, as the board of experts, technocrats, if you're willing to say, say. So uh, sometimes it's the austerity measure, sometimes it's cut like other stuff, but usually so it was austerity measures. So uh, it necessarily, the problematic thing is their sovereignty and people being able to choose what their economical policy is going to be versus forced austerity with conditional loans that, that are happening and like pushback that is coming from there. So that's the one type uh, that is happening. And second type is IMF loaning to some very bad people uh, who necessarily ruined like not, not necessarily the, the the most democratic regimes so these are the two main topics that are brought up third topic is related to other institutions that are going to talk about in relations to imf which is necessarily creation of additional institutions that are going to compete with the imf for uh, the influence so let's briefly talk about the the first one so the Usually, what is uh, what, what is um, the clash uh, when we when you talk about conditionality and what should we condition or should we not condition or something like that? So the problematic thing is that 
even if you wanted to IMF to, to, to be a charity organization, it's not. And even if these countries uh, that are develop, developing or something like that are owed something, IMF is not necessarily the way to go. And specifically, it's specifically tied to if there is no conditionality and if there are no none of none of these measures that are ensuring the the how do you say return of capital and return of money, there is a high risk of a lot of uh, countries pulling uh, pulling out in terms of uh, lowering the amount that they're willing to invest in the in the bank, which necessarily then means that there is lower pools of pool of money to be uh, how do you say uh, given out as loans to the countries, which is sometimes very bad in terms of that if you have nobody else to loan from, your risk of being uh, forced to declare bankruptcy, which is also bad for your credit rating and being able to borrow in the future, but also bad for your economy in terms of uh, not being able to pay off your workers, having to cut social spending and, and stuff like that. The paradox is that uh, with IMF, how do you say, uh, conditions you usually have to cut your spending anyway uh, so there is like the trend is that the IMF is slowly abandoning uh, the demands for hardcore austerity as they did in the past in terms of that it's been shown economically that it doesn't work that it slows the economy down it makes people spend less um, it makes people miserable which in turn is not good for the economy if and if it's not good for the economy it just brings countries to uh, worse and worse conditions which makes them unable to pay that anyway so it's not smart anyway so this is an example where technocrats don't, don't really uh, do a good job in that regard so so th there is a but th there is a second point if you are allowing so in international law there is a concept of uh internet like uh, borrowing privileges are allowed for the people who are de facto controlling of the state which means that when you when imf is loaning the money this money is being used by people who are in power currently so the case for conditionality not necessarily austerity per se is that without it uh lots of corruption uh people being unable to to do any kind of reforms and just perpetuating and throwing their country into more debt than just fleeing like some people did congo uh specific uh, from congo specifically so just by not giving conditions, you're leaving it up to politicians who are usually either populist and awful and are leaving their countries, uh, would not make their countries, uh, how do you say, would not do unpopular measures in their countries. So there is few things that are tied with politicians, there are mechani like mechanism that can prove uh, why conditionality is sometimes good. Specifically, like politicians are there to be elected in terms of that that's their goal, which means that unpopular measures, if it's not pushed on them, necessarily then means that it's not going to be done. So it's very unpopular to cut spending, uh, public spending anyway, even if it's unsustainable or something like that. So by not having anybody telling you, you need to cut this, it will probably just continue and be passed on to another administration or something like that. Uh, sadly, like, like the answer to that would be, oh, but like, people would know after a few years or something like that, but like, it's not necessarily something that happens. People vote on different metrics and there is different ways for countries and governments to uh, blame other stuff rather than their fa economical failings or something like that. It's necessarily tied to a lot of people not necessarily understanding how economics work. And this is something that you can necessarily use in the debate if you talk about conditionality, is it okay, is it not? Second thing, uh, that can be talked about is this uh, issue of them giving the uh, funds to some very bad regimes and also that, that perpetuates, how do I say, dictatorial tendency, tendencies in some regimes. So, so the problematic thing is, like, like I already said, in the international, uh, in the international law, people who borrow money are and people who will have the de facto control over money is the elected government which sometimes doesn't mean it's very elected which sometimes means that e 
it's it was a mock election it wasn't really uh, as democratic as it was say so in the past currently it's changing with more scrutiny specifically on the internet uh, it's changing like so so there is more scrutiny in terms of uh imf who is imf loaning the money to and who, who are they not but in previous years they uh, landed money to mobutu in congo for example which necessarily uh, never came to the people of congo which also propagated the regime and was just plain awful uh, in in that regard which means that countries are paying the price uh, and like and here's the deal so when these people use this money the debt that stays stays with the sovereign nation and doesn't follow the corrupt politician that did this awful stuff so there is an argument to be made that if you're willing to condition loans in certain regards and ask countries to uh, i don't know uh, to do something and to give up their sovereignty uh, it should be on you then to to also control how is that money being used? Is it being used in a corrupt way or something like that? And not just care about your uh, own self-interest and being able to, to get back that money. The problematic thing is that people who will pay that off are taxpayers, and taxpayers are people who are living in that country, which is necessarily then awful if it's illegitimate. So the debates that are happening in that regard are specifically semifinals, uh, semifinals of uh, open of Mexico, uh, world, which is uh, that there should be international tribunal, uh, tribunal characterizing uh, debt as odious debt and nullifying it uh, to a certain regard. Again, uh, like previously, uh, the, one of the main points why not is the fact that it would probably lead to some uh, countries pulling out their funds, which necessarily uh, or also increasing the interest rate or because it also makes their loan unstable uh, in terms of that they're not having the assurance that it will be paid back even if somebody fails or something like that, which is, like I stated, sadly their goal, like making money, which then makes, uh, which then makes that argument really powerful if you want to say that uh, the alternatives are worse, like AIB or BRICS, uh, BRICS uh, Developmental Bank or something like that. Or if you want to claim that there will be less money overall, which in turn means that people who will need that money won't have the access to it. So even despite all of this criticism and all of this awful stuff, uh, the pragmatic, pragmatist side would say, pragmatist would say that lower lower money in this international funds is necessarily something that's very bad for these countries moving on to to similar institutions than imf and then i'll briefly talk about world bank because they're they have different goals so uh currently and in the past like four to five years there were arising challengers to the imf the alternatives the problematic thing about these alternatives is that they have way, way lower amount of money to spend. Which then means that usually they, can, they can't satisfy the demand that is happening. But also, it's not coming from, even if the IMF is very bad, and you're not going to, in terms of like their records in the past, uh, it's not as bad as the countries, some countries that are willing to offer alternative. So, Specifically, one alternative is that one alternative that is prop, propping up is BRICS. So BRICS is the collaboration of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. Uh, it's like they cover forty-three percent of the world population. They're very large and should be very powerful. They started meeting very like generally having a non-binding meeting just discussing and discussing what to do in the future similar to g7 g20 or something like that so they just meet and talk but at, like in 2014 it moved past that stage in terms of that they actually did some concrete stuff with establishment of two new institutions one is BRICS development bank or new development bank uh, 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 secondly 
is BRICS contingent reserve arrangement. Uh, and these two are necessarily made to, how do you say, uh, be a competition to the IMF and the World Bank and the Western-led institutions. So this is a coalition. Like the, the problem, so, 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 so what's the problem with, with, with this coalition of these? So the good thing is that they're regional, regional superpowers wherever they are, and like some of them are aspiring to be world dominant superpowers. The problematic thing is that specifically China and Russia and to a certain extent, South Africa are not really democratic and have their own problems with human rights abuses or something like that, which means they're more willing to tolerate that stuff into the parties that they're loaning to. But secondly, they are, uh, But, but secondly, it makes them grow in terms of power and influence, which if you want to claim that human rights or democracy and the people living there in China or something like that are an important actor is not somewhat, not very good in terms of that it propagates the already existing regimes of Putin or CCP. Or something like that. So, but like it, it exists. So, so the debate mainly that that happened with BRICS, and that specifically that BRICS, but BRICS can can be used in different debates as an example, is specifically uh, one that was partial quarters at Warsaw, if I'm not Warsaw years, if I'm not mistaken. That is this house supports BRICS BRICS countries creating alternatives to current international economic institutions, IMF, World Bank. World Trade Organizations or something like that. So, so the, the basic premises of this is that if they compete with each other for people who are they loaning to, the, that will be a race to the top in terms of that these countries would get better conditions. So that's true and not true in, 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 in multiple matters. So it's true in terms of that IMF started being more careful uh, and like responding to criticism whilst before they were fuck we don't who cares you you're you're we are your only hope uh, the problematic thing is if you compare the budgets of these two uh, the budget of the IMF is approximately 600 650 650 billion whilst the uh, fund of um, for example, BRICS contingent reserve arrangement, which is the uh, the institution that is that, that, that is comparable to IMF, is 100, 100 billion, which is six more than six times larger. Which means that it's not really as competitive, and like IMF can outcompete them, and they haven't been doing that much stuff that people would like them to do. So even if it's a support motion, and in the future they might probably do stuff, they weren't that active and they cannot be that active just by sheer fact that they do not have as much money as they would. China is dominating there. China has over 40% of voting power. Whilst IMF is not perfect by any means, US still has only 15%, so it's arguably more democratic than, than this. So these are some problems. And it also like I told you, there is a whole area or area of argumentation that is stating this, even even at the expense of competition, like like competition bringing excellence and bringing better results for the consumer and, and the consumer being the countries. This is bringing more influence to China and China being uh, in China's rise to becoming a global superpower. So one of the main issues is is that worth it and is that okay? by giving that amount of power to China. So, uh, the, um, I'm not gonna, so there's some specific differences of how are they operating and how are they willing to do. They will never be important in, term, in terms of debating. Uh, nobody will uh, expect that amount of specific knowledge for you to know what currency swaps are or something like that. So, so I'm not going to go and delve into these topics, but if you're interested and if you study economics, you probably know <laughs> this stuff. But like there are differences between these institutions, but like for the sake of 
the debate and the debates that will happen, they're pretty on par and similar. The problem is that they have way less money than, than uh, how do you say, IMF. So comparable institutions, uh, so, so I already talked about uh, BRICS, uh, BRICS Contingent Reserve Arrangement, which is comparable to IMF. And the second thing is New Development Bank or BRICS Development Bank, which is then comparable to World Bank. So the World Bank uh, is not the bank of all banks. Uh, it's the basically also for for-profit organizations, which uh, their goal, main goal, is a reduction in poverty. Uh, they're also doing stuff about environmental environmental standards, switching to renewable resources. Uh, the point is they're different to IMF because IMF is loaning to keep a country afloat and this is loan, a loaning in order to uh, provide some developmental options in order to reduce poverty overall in a country. Also, this is not a developmental aid organization, so they're expecting their money back even if they're loaning it to you. So uh, World Bank comes up less than than IMF in the debates. I haven't seen it as a specific actor. I'm not sure ever just targeted like that. The point is, in comparison to others, uh, it's it's usually mentioned. So so it's usually comparable to Western institution. Also, you, it's U.S. dominated. It's also 15% uh, U.S. Uh, and it's uh, by amount like the voting power goes by the amount that you are willing to invest, which facilitates that you're willing to invest more in order to get that power. Um, what is what, what is it comparable to is two institutions. One is, well, they're basically really similar because they're both dominated by China, but one is, like I said, BRICS Developmental Bank and also Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. They were both formed in 2014. Uh, Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank is formed by China as an institution that that uh, that is trying to uh, to do the same thing but like uh, compete with the western institution and BRICS is con like has been created by all of them uh, all of the BRICS uh, BRICS nations the, the point is that they're focusing more on the infrastructure which necessarily is tied with Chinese project one belt one road initiative which is necessarily trying to tie uh, countries to uh, like and tying the, them with roads and uh, with China in order to facilitate trade with them and stuff like that. So it's also, also not really, even if the, the main goal is developing countries, the byproduct mostly from these two is also developing the project that China is willing to, to back, which is not necessarily a bad thing because people are getting stuff. But the point is, both of these institutions are also for profit. They're also not there to give aid. They're not there to give uh, free loans. They also want their money back and they also operate on a profit basis. So even if the conditions are lower, even if the China um, makes the payment over multiple of years, over multiple of years, the problem is uh, it's still, they still expect their money back. So it's not, the, not a charity project. So. What's bad about it is specifically because China doesn't necessarily care about, like, you can claim that even the U.S. doesn't really care about human rights and the democracy and it's just a pretend thing, but just the fact that it's a pretend, pretend thing and means that they have to keep pretending to be caring about these facts, which necessarily means that they're much more up for scrutiny. Um, when it comes to loaning, especially in 2018, when it comes to loaning to dictatorial regimes, even if it happened in the past and propagating this stuff. Whilst China doesn't really care that much, specifically when you when you think about like them loaning, loaning and giving, giving projects to Kenya, which is not necessarily currently in a great state of democracy in Kenyatta. Uh, and yeah, so, 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 so the the main point the main point of the debate would be uh, would if if we talk about like is it good to have this sort of competition or not so is specifically is it good for China to gain power and secondly would that 
China choosing who to loan to, would, would it be good or would it be actually bad for the people of this country in terms of maybe propagating regimes that are not as good and stuff. So there is a whole array of issues that, that needs to be discussed. For example, when they invest, Chinese usually bring their own workers, uh, labor standards deteriorate, markets are flooded with Chinese goods that like, ruins the maybe the economies of these countries, but this is somewhat for another lecture. Uh, I don't have necessarily the time to, to cover it uh, per se. So, yeah, we, we, we have to move on if there are no further questions from specifically these financial institutions. So, so this is the one way to, to, to how to say, develop your country, which is through uh, international and financial institutions. But another way which is important and which comes up clearly a lot is about trade blocks and specifically that like our world is more and more trying to be tied with these uh, trade agreements uh, that are that are multilateral that are including multitude of countries and that are, have the tendency of becoming much more than the trade block that they are currently right now main example like like european union started as a trade european union that started as a trade block and ended up where we are currently with more political politically and geopolitical integration so this is what it what it, what will lead me so this middle section of the workshop is going to be muddied in terms of that some of these some of these uh, how do you say uh Agreements are just trade blocks with tendency to become something more, and some of them are ge already formed geopolitical units. So, I'm mainly going to talk about now, um, firstly, about stuff that is over, that is not yet become a political unit. So, a ASEAN, Mercosur, uh, NAFTA, a little bit about NAFTA because there is not that much time, and a little bit about TPP and TTIP and these abbreviations. So, first of all, trade deals overall. So, what might be the problem? What is the... Why do we sometimes have the motions that are regretting certain, like TPP or, or regretting certain trade deals? So, main issue with it is, first of all, you are giving up some sort of sovereignty in terms of that if you agree with some, like, obviously Trump didn't follow that, but if you agree with somebody that you won't raise tariffs on certain produce or something like that, this necessarily means that you cannot then vote for something else other than, like, leaving that trade agreement or something like that. So it limits the ability of countries to operate their own policy, which is not problematic, until it comes to stuff about the environment and labor regulations. So, usual clause that is happening inside of the uh, lots of these tr trade agreements and stuff like that, which is problematic and which is controversial, is this ISDS clause, which is investor uh, investor settlement uh, uh, in, <laughs> investor state dispute settlements, which necessarily means. Uh, and inserts into the agreement, how are we going to deal if there is a dispute between multinational corporations and the state that they're operating in? So the problematic thing is that usually when people write about it and read about it, it's more panic than, it actu than the actual reality is. So what is the clause? It says that multinational corporation or corporation can sue a state that is uh, increasing the standards or something like that above what is being agreed in the trade agreement or something like that. So, and they can sue for loss of profit or something like that. So where it's usually relevant is stuff like environment. So, so what people are saying that if you want to increase the environmental standards, you might not be able to, specifically because somebody will sue you and you will have to pay money. So there is two aspects of that. One is that usually, and, and sorry, uh, one, one more thing is, where does this happen is necessarily arbitration. So arbitration, I will talk about it a bit, a bit later in my workshop, but arbitration is necessarily when 
you both parties choose who is going to adjudicate them and there is usually professional arbiters and there is international uh, court of arbitration which also has this where they choose who is going to arbitrate and adjudicate um, the 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 thing so the problematic thing is that people people feel that first of all uh, even if even if the claims are not happening that often, one of the more prominent examples where that happened is necessarily Philip Morris versus the Australian government, where the Australian government wanted to curb down smoking, and Philip Morris actually sued them and won uh, on the basis that uh, the pictures uh, that that are uh, the, the, these horrible pictures of of that, that you know from European Union probably and we in Serbia do not have uh, of people cancer uh, and stuff like that is necessarily limiting their profit margins and stuff like that so they won that dispute. Uh, the problematic thing is that that's maybe the maybe the only prominent example. It's not happening that often and it's not that doom and gloom. And also Australia still has that law and didn't really care that much and Philip Morris didn't win in terms of that they had to change something. The problematic thing is that there is a, a fear that countries that are in trade blocks that, that are about to enter some trade blocks or something like that uh, are not even going to try to increase some standards, labor or environment, specifically in order to uh, not be put into a position of somebody suing them over that. So that chilling effect uh, is necessarily then limiting the ability of people to make policies, which necessarily, if, if it comes to environment or, how do you say, uh, environment or um, labor standards, is something that is inherent in human dignity, first of all, safety and security standards, minimum minimum wage, working hours, minimum working hour, maximum working hours, and stuff like that, or not polluting the, polluting, I was gonna swear, uh, not polluting the, the country uh, out of the existence or something like that. So, so this is the good thing, so, so this is ISDS. But the good thing about trade blocks and trade agreements is that they usually try, and TPP tried to do that, ACN have that, Mercosur doesn't really have that, but like we, we'll talk more. Uh, so is that they try to also incorporate stuff about environmental regulation. So they try to set some standard, which is usually above minimum, which is usually meeting somewhere in the middle of uh, between uh, the countries. So why? So if you're willing, especially if you're the US, if you want to compete with somebody, uh, if you are upholding yourself to higher environmental standards and other countries are not, their, their how do you say, products would be cheaper and in turn then uh, you would have to lower your regulation in order for you to be able to compete on any level which necessarily brings that race to the bottom and stuff like that. So trade blocks, just because everybody's selfish and do not want to have that race to the bottom, usually include some clause of minimum standards of, uh, how do you say, environmental protections, in which makes their, makes their how do you say, uh, makes them secure that the competition won't be on the environment, which is uh, some, sometimes very unpopular. This is this is what ACN did, and this is what was supposed to be included in the DPP Trans-Pacific Partnership, if it was would be to, to be implemented. So these are the two things. So what adheres also into all of the trade blocks is that they usually have uh, that they usually uh, usually have. Uh, Elimination of tariffs, if not com if not completely, then then to to very very low regard. Uh, sometimes they have uh, common external tariffs. Sometimes they have uh, more things that are more in terms of uh, tighter union, like freedom of movement of labor, capital, uh, people, uh, and services. So. Uh, these all things are good for the development specifically of the economies that are currently weaker and that with the tariffs they cannot really import if if, if the target market is the us you cannot if you have the huge tariff that is in on the and that's what 
Trump is banking on right now. You cannot really compete with the US, US produce that is maybe higher quality or something like that, which necessarily means that you cannot develop your economy. Why? Specifically because we are developing countries are, and we, uh, lots of our tied with the pool of money that they have currently and trade is the only way to bring in external money that you do not have right now which necessarily then mean leads to growth in the um the leads to the economical growth and having higher standards because you now have more money inside of your country so the good thing is that even if these countries are currently uh, having lower standards, labor lab, labor standards or something like that, even if uh, the labor flees from the United States, it's a way of redistribute, redistributing cash uh, by not, redistrib not really doing this stuff in terms of uh, developmental aid or something like that, just propagating businesses and opening the businesses in these countries, which is very good for the development of these nations. So let me briefly talk about few of these actors before I talked about talk about. So let's first start with ACN because it's very interesting and it, it's bound to be much more important in the future even, even though it's very important right now. So the members of ACN Union is, the ACN is basically Southeast Asian Union of countries. Uh, which includes Indonesia, Cambodia, uh, Brunei, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. Uh, also, they have a working relationship with, they, they, they have ACM plus three, which is necessarily also not full members, but like uh, observers and cooperators, which is China, Japan, and South Korea. This is huge in terms of that lots of, and especially economical development is moving to that region. They have a, a rise in, uh, they have a huge rise in population. They also have a huge rise in like uh, economical purchasing power and stuff like that. So, uh, ASEAN has the, has the, how do you say, um, aspiration to become more than a trade block uh, in terms of that they have a plan for possible monetary union in the future. Uh, and yeah, uh, but like the way that they started is they, they started as the common market, specifically trade block that is uh, uh, allowing free trades of goods like capital services and labor, uh, like in the European Union. The, the good thing about it is that they're also inserting uh, stuff and like uh, they also uh, have a common, uh, how do you say, airspace in terms of that like airplanes can flow from each country without needing to get a permission which is huge for for example travel tourism but also huge for uh, trade and stuff and it's also uh, uh, with the, the passing of goods it also makes the whole market stronger because you know if you're investing in that region you have the access to all these other markets and also so uh, given all of that let's talk about I'm not going to go into all of the fact stuff. I'm going to talk about what the motion can be. Otherwise, this is useless. So ASEAN comes up decent. Not, not, it comes up in terms of an actor, and it will probably come up in the future as an actor in, in lots of motions. So usually the motions that gather around it is their a relationship, relationship with China, and specifically that ASEAN is somewhat been created to counter China, China's dominance in the region. So if we stick together, they cannot, they cannot do stuff as they would wish to. And also uh, handling the internal problems that are happening. So three, uh, so uh, like Myanmar and the Rohingyas, Myanmar is the part of ASEAN, and this is something that they need to that, that they need to figure out and lack of response was necessarily something that's very bad so a few things uh there is specific and thirdly sorry there is specific motions tied with should and sh or should or should they not tie more be more tightly integrated should they even uh, get monetary unions or or stuff like that which is basic for a lot of these countries, you have lots of uh, similar arguments if you talk about monetary unions or, or tighter integrations. So let's talk about China first. So individually, 
these countries are very unlikely to stand up to China on their own. Where would they have to stand up to China even? So the so main, main problem and the focus that they're having right now is the South China Sea dispute. That is where Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, Brunei and China all have claims over some portion. And specifically, they have a problematic relationship with China that is claiming the whole thing and building artificial islands. So the problem th problematic thing is that the whole ASEAN Union has not been very united in the way how are they going to respond to what is China doing. So Philippines is having is taking it to another level in terms of that they did brought up the case in uh, ICJ or International uh, International Court of Justice, which they won, but it didn't matter in the end. Uh, the problematic thing is should and how would how should ASEAN react? Should uh, ASEAN maybe uh, try to get more cozier to the China and maybe uh, make China? So, so one of one of the reasons and one of one of the pragmatistic reasons why China desires South China Sea is because if somebody else controls it, which is not an ally of theirs, necessarily means that they would have problems with trade and somebody bearing them in some certain way. So maybe by them being closer to China in terms of relationship makes China much more willing to cooperate and to negotiate and to settle disputes in South China Sea, which is important to these countries. Or should they take a more aggressive stance, which should maybe can maybe backfire, but if they stand together, maybe they can withstand because China is also exporting a lot of things to uh, to that nation, and they're also on their back door, which also means that China doesn't want, really want them as the enemy. Uh, the yeah, the, so 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 this is ba basic stuff about China that is yet to be, yet to be decided. They're pretty mild about China currently. They're not really denouncing or, or doing stuff like that because they're pragmatists. They do not want to piss off the huge neighbor that is on to, to the north. Second problem that I that I pinpointed is is the tighter integration something that is good or bad. So what usually the problem with tighter integration, like you see with European Union, is first of all the differences in cultures is necessarily something that can. Uh, make some people feel that they're losing sovereignty to somebody who's not really going to do stuff in their own interest. So differences in ethnicity, religion is sometimes something that brings, uh, if you mash these people together and if they lose their own sovereignty, necessarily then leads to people backlashing and and maybe breaking up the things that we already had so it's maybe the fact that if you want more you might risk losing it all in that sort of situation but also the differences between these countries and this is specifically tied to monetary union uh, in terms of economy uh, with indonesia being the dominant economy with the majority of people is somewhat risky in terms of uh, if you do have this monetary union you cannot uh, cater your monetary policy to your own specific needs, which necessarily then means that you are in the risk of, like maybe you, the inflation for your country specific, specifically this moment should be a little bit higher, maybe interest rate should be a little bit higher, but you're tied with this full regime, uh, how do you say, of uh, having to cooperate with everybody and having to have the same currency. Why monetary union may be better here than any other place in the world is specifically because they are not really trading amongst themselves as much as they're exporting to other countries. So trade amongst ASEAN nations is 20% of their trade, like approximately 20% of their trade, while the exports to the other nation, US, China, is 80% uh, of, of, of this. So what does that mean? That means that if you're an exporter nation, you benefit much more from stuff like currency stability, which necessarily then means that that like the fluctuation and uh, the fluctuation of your own currency and your own economic downturn uh, does not affect the trade as much to the external to to the external how do you say to to people who are willing to to import stuff from you in these sort of situations. So the stronger uh, like more stable currency amongst themselves, which they can make stable because there is 
multitude of them and they can vouch for each other which is also a topic for another for for another uh, how do you say lecture on monetary what the monetary policy is is somewhat better for asian nations than it may be even for european union or something like that so so this is worth considering lastly because we're not running out of time but we have to cover a lot of other stuff uh, the the bad uh, the criticism of ASEAN is their non-responding to Myanmar and Rohingya crisis. This year's summit, they did criticize and pushed uh, uh, pushed for answers. What is happening or something like that? But like they still haven't done enough. There's still a crisis and genocide happening uh, in Myanmar and like the exile of Rohingya people uh, and Myanmar being the part of ASEAN. It makes it their problem and it makes them a unique actor that can maybe solve this issue which they are not doing currently they even have a joint uh, how do you say declaration of human rights protection which is also me and what me and mar signed and in spite of their own how do you say agreement it's still being trampled by what Myanmar is doing and they're not responding in a sufficient manner so there are motions that i saw specifically should ASEAN countries have their own peacekeeping operation there should they should they have peacekeeping overall on the settlement disputes inside of their own region which is somewhat good in terms of uh, clash are they alienating possible members possible members and, and people who are there or with with like this should should this soft pressure be enough economical pressure be enough in order to to curb the human rights abuses that are happening and is that their own mission or should somebody else take care of that this is something to think about this is not something that i can delve that much into currently with the state of our time so one more thing is well, let me one second notes so mercosur or i maybe butchered that i don't know this is a trade block of Latin America and this is a trade block that also has the tendency to unionize by the model of European Union and to become much more tightly integrated than they are currently so the members of the Mercosur are Brazil Argentina Paraguay Uruguay and Venezuela that is suspended currently and that's very interesting and I'll talk when I'll talk about motions interesting maybe way to solve that crisis or something like that. associate countries are all other countries of 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 latin america almost all which is bolivia chile peru cambodia equator and Suriname. so they are currently customs union uh, customs union and trading block by that regard but they aspire to increase uh, themselves to a next level which is also freedom of movement of goods capital service and labor which is four things that you should remember which means that you can work anywhere in, in this trade block so why isn't why isn't everybody part of Mercosur specifically because some of these other nations have uh, other interests specifically Chile is trading much more with the United States than they're trading with their neighbors which means that they're much more benefiting with having a bilateral agreement with uh, US and also dealing with Mercosur on their own whilst if they're inside of the Mercosur they would probably have to have common external tariffs towards everybody and agree with with, with, with all of the things they are part though of uh, uh, yeah so 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 yeah so so basically that's it so they are working with like so mercosur and the other block that that, that is that is relevant but mercosur much more the ambien community of nations uh they are working towards south american integration into union of south american nations USAM, or something like that so, so they were willing in the future to become somewhat more like the European Union in order to be stronger or something like that. The biggest economy there currently is uh, Brazil by mile, uh, and they are currently dominating it. Interesting thing about Mercosur, uh, and specifically Latin America nations, is that they're usually center-left and usually 
they do not have like it's changing a bit in Brazil specifically, but usually they have lots of centrist uh, center left parties which are pro welfare and pro how do you say uh, labor standards and stuff like that, which means that comparison to other free trade blocks and stuff like that, they're interesting. So what is interesting about Mercosur? What can be emotion about it and stuff like that? So Brazil, specifically, like I told you, Brazil is the part of BRICS. And so, 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 so they're, they part, they're part of both, how do you say, uh, continuums. But like uh, how they deal with internal crises of Latin America is somewhat very interesting, specifically by them suspending the membership of Venezuela uh, because of Maduro and uh, the, the things that are happening in Venezuela. This is not something that is necessarily working currently uh, that much, well, he's still in power, but is somewhat a step in the right direction. We saw a lot of, like, we didn't see some specific Mercosur debate, but we did saw, uh, see a motion that says that, uh, like, Latin American nations and neighbors should uh, facilitate and uh, how do you say promote a coup uh, in in Venezuela, but like somewhat of an economical sanctions and economical uh, pressure on Venezuela is something that is also very important and can might might lead to uh, good outcomes, which is happening already with uh, Mercosur uh, suspending the membership of of Venezuela in that regard. So, but there is not much thing other than knowing this as an example and as a block there's not much specific motions in europe happening there probably are in latin america but like specifically because probably people do not know much people are not setting this mercosur specific motion but it's worth knowing that that exists and that they are type <coughs> integrating themselves more and more so more of the interesting of the interesting trade blocks one of them is obviously european union but like i told you i'm not gonna cover that as much because there is no not much time and that's that's a huge topic so one more trade block which is more of now running to more of being a geopolitical unit is uh, and we're sliding to that to that side of the workshop which is european uh Eurasian Economic Union, which is again creating of the Soviet uh, bloc uh, and stuff like that. So, so through 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 integrating of economy. So this is a fairly new, how do you say, a fairly new union. While it's been in the making after the breakup of Soviet Union, it's recently new. So. The members currently are Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, and mo most importantly, Russia. So they have single market between themselves. They have free movement of good capital services and labor, which facilitates the growth in, in all these countries. So but what is interesting is that they're, first of all, they are vouching, in, uh, they have the plan that by the 2025, they want to have a more common currency common monetary union like we talked in the ACM uh, portion and also uh, they also want to have a common uh, how do you say energy market electricity market uh, by 2025 as well which means that they can exchange and and um, operate together on that front which means that they and also integration in terms of uh, military uh, politic po political union similar to European Union problematic thing is that clearly currently and the, the russia is dominant the dominant player there vladimir putin which necessarily means that it's not same as european union in terms of yes it's supranational yes it's a trade block but like clearly russia dominates and not in the way that germany dominates european union which means that it's much more prone to to follow russian uh, how do you say uh, goals and stuff like that so the debates and motions that can happen about it and that did happen uh, is specifically about are central east uh, central asian nations better off in the uh, eurasian economical union or not that was the if i'm not mistaken esl semis for cambridge ivy 
year before year in 2016, which is necessarily a debate more about like are we gaining more from how they say trade and facilitating facilitating growth through there or giving up more through tying ourselves more with Russia, which is has not necessarily shown itself to be a great host or some ally or stuff like that. So, but you see a pattern and trend there that a lot of countries are now gathering and grouping in this small, how do you say, um, how do you say, blocks in which they want to exert power, they want to have much more bargaining power overall. So one of the also good things about every everyone that I've talked about previously is that if you are together with somebody in a trade block and you are uh, negotiating with, like, I don't know, a different country or the US or a big country that you want to give some concession for, you have much more vote bargaining power if you're together than if you're separate in terms of that these little trade blocks, even if they're conceding something to, like, conceding their sovereignty, conceding their ability to, I don't know, decide some of the stuff, they're still gaining in... Uh, relative power towards the, the big nations that are uh, that have the influence over them so uh, so in order not to to be cut off from the YouTube uh, I will have one more thing in this section and then I'll talk about international justice and then we'll be done so last thing that I want to talk about about supranational organization uh, is African Union which is also very, very interesting and very relevant and has a lot of debates happening about it. So one thing, one moment. Mm, notes. So African Union has been established in 2001. Previously, yeah. Uh, okay, so it's, it's been established in 2001. It currently encompasses all 55 nations uh, that are in the African continent, so it's pretty uh, comprehensive. Uh, currently, the, the newest the member that, that was had their rights suspended was, was um, Morocco, but they, they, they're back in, or stuff like that. Currently, the, the main, how do you say, center uh, of uh, the organization African Union is in Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Interesting fact is that the headquarters are built by China, which is good gesture by Chinese in order to have goodwill, uh, to show goodwill for, from their side in order to get. So uh, the current, current president, which can be very useful maybe to know, is Paul Kagame from Rwanda, which was uh, responsible for current stability in Rwanda, in Rwanda uh, ha happening currently, even though it's an, at an expense of some freedoms or stuff like that. Uh, so they are also willing and like their the aspiration is to have a tighter union similar to European Union, which is necessarily going to have probably and maybe a similar currency. And we had that motion previously, like monetary, they, have, they should have monetary union which should have a uh, African passport and like freedom of movement throughout throughout all of, all of the countries uh, and, and which is trying to mitigate the the fact that colonialism firstly uh, left a lot of people in the borders that are not that they were not willing to live in specifically because it was very poorly and awfully drawn so they're trying to integrate themselves currently uh, they're facilitating trade between themselves. The problematic thing is African nations are not trading as much uh, with within their own uh, within their own union as much as they're trading external, which is also something that is good to know if we talk about monetary union. But like what they're trying to do is propagate uh, this uh, trade uh, this trade inside inside of the countries by removing uh, tariffs between by by. Uh, in allowing foreign labor and stuff like that. The problematic thing, again, is the diversity that exists there necessarily leads to, uh, I don't know, ethnic and uh, religious tensions in terms of they also have 
they took our jobs like every country in the history of the world had this i they like this this sort of people are taking is taking my job or something less specifically if it's like well more developed countries versus the less developed countries which is somewhat of a problem in south africa currently with migrant labor and stuff like that but it is getting better and, and they're trying to solve but like the more important mission that they have is they're trying to promote peace and stability through their peacekeeping missions which separates them from one of these other trade blocks so they have like joint military operations and they have like basically two of them one is in darfur in sudan which is necessarily uh, it was seven thousand uh, peacekeeping personnel the problem is it wasn't very effective uh, the genocide and the thing that happened there still happened. The problem is that it was too large of uh, an area for 7,000 people to take care of. It's uh, an area of France or approximately of France, which means that they did have some uh, effect. And like the good part is that they starting to do uh, to do this integration uh, to, to do this peacekeeping integration and stuff like that. But like it didn't really work that well in the future. It'll become more effective, I bet. Second mission that they had is Somalia, where they had 8,000 people in the similar uh, area. They had more of a success there in terms of pre preventing some atrocities that they did have in Sudan. But it also is not, it's, uh, first of all, it's too, too little. Uh, personnel in order to 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 actually wage a war uh, and to to actually do a peacekeeping mission like that but it's also a good first step in order for establishing a regional uh, peacekeeping mission uh, in comparison to the us or somebody else doing it which has proven either bad in the past or the west is not really willing anymore to do to do stuff like that after somalia in the 90s and rwanda so what 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 they also are good at and where where emotions can lie is the political so not not all of these countries are democracies obviously like not a lot of countries not all of the countries in the world are democracies anyway so but like the fact where they can have a lot of power is specifically where they did have a, a year or two ago uh when the gambia when the president didn't want to step down the threat of african union uh, like suspending the membership rights and like alienating the country actually made the president step down and concede power when he lost an election, which is a win for African Union and actually empowers and shows power to other uh, African nations, what the African Union can do in, in, in their own country. So the motions that are happening around the African Union and specifically that in particular, peacekeeping, uh, should they have a joint military? Should they have a joint peacekeeping as an alternative to the US or to the West or to China? Uh, also, African Union's relationship to China in terms of should they pivot to China or to the East or should they like uh, go to the West or stuff like that? So currently the climate um, and the thoughts about China are very positive in the Africa, even though uh, a lot of workers are like like i mentioned like chinese labor coming to kenya and building their railroads the still the overarching overarching view of china is decently positive from the majority of countries so the relationship with china is the second second point uh the third point is the political rights should they suspend membership rights or should they try to pull it, bully and pressure the countries that are not democratic to become democratic is that a good idea or not so this is also a, a case of if you want to so it, it's a no it would be a noble goal but the pragmatist would say that maybe it's not as a good idea because if you want more maybe you will lose everything that you have already so this is the point and the finally the, the motion that, that that i saw is like also monetary fund um mon mon monetary union motion which necessarily then means that they would have uh, same currency and stuff like that, which can be a good thing in terms of stabilizing their currency, currencies and uh, removing the power out of some dictator's hands into deciding monetary policy, which can be useful, but it might be also very bad 
uh, in terms of uh, like not being able to uh, target because the, the economies are so, so diverse in the whole continent because it, it's huge. Uh, the point is not being able to dictate your own monetary policy can be detrimental to uh, your own development and to your own getting out of the crisis, which is also very bad. They also, brief, briefly, they also have in plan uh, something that should, uh, let me say, uh, compete with the World Bank and the International Marketing Fund, which is African Monetary Fund, which is in development. It's not been developed yet. It's not been invested in yet, but it's something that has been planned and that can be good. What leads me into my African Union talk leads me very good and very well into the third section, which is international justice, because one of the more important African Union topics is should they create their own international justice court as a, as a, as a comp not competition, but like and, and exit the international criminal court that is currently operating uh, overall in the countries. So, let me one okay one second so what is the icc and this is also a very very common uh, actor that props up so the icc is international criminal court that has the mandate to adjudicate uh, about like war crimes genocide crimes against humanity and these uh, these sort of crimes, so, so they have the mandates to prosecute uh, people from the member state states that are members of the ICC, uh, and like hold them to court. It's a subsidiary in terms of that if these people can be adjudicated in their own countries or by some other how they say institution, a better way. It can be done, and it, like the ICC concedes power. The problematic thing is that if the justice comes from their own country, from the country of where the perpetrator committed the crime, it's usually biased on either side. Either the people who are in power are people who support awful things, or either are not very, very likely to heavily criticize what he did, or they're overly criticizing uh, and maybe in that in that regard not fair so what is the criticism of the icc uh the problematic thing is that it's highly been criticized for not upholding the standards overall uh the problematic thing about icc is that it's voluntary so you have to have to sign in sign up to be adjudicated by that by that court if you do not want to cooperate sadly there is a little way to to, to, to press you, like you can still be pressed by NGOs or states uh, condemning or stuff like that. But like if nobody's willing to do an intervention, uh, military intervention or sanctions or stuff like that, it's very unlikely uh, to be enforceable if people do not want it to be enforced. And a lot of debates about ICC is going to be specifically about that. And that uh, willingness of people to opt into that system and that willingness is necessarily tied to it being perceived as fair. Why is it not being perceived as fair? Specifically, because it's firstly being viewed as very racist by African and African Union, is because like all of the cases, the majority, almost all of the cases, specifically in the past a few years, is about uh, uh, African states and is about the crimes and wars that happened there and not necessarily about the atrocities that were happening and that were committed by the United States, by Russia and stuff like that. The problematic thing is that you cannot really uh, adjudicate the United States because they do not, like if they do not wish to concede that right to the ICC, even if even if they per se say, even if you adjudicate somebody, if they're not willing to extradite or they're not willing to cooperate, nobody cares. So there are a few motions that are very interesting and I find them very interesting and very cool. One is specifically, should the ICC denounce, um, should the ICC, uh, how do you say, prosecute Bill Clinton and uh, um, George W. Bush? which is necessarily not something that is going to work per se, not something that is 
uh, going to make them extradited, make them go to jail because probably they won't be extradited. There would be protests about it. But like just the message of ICC being perceived as somebody who's not biased. Look, they're doing this. Look, they're trying to prosecute. They're doing this currently to, to Russia, trying to look into the crimes in uh, eastern Ukraine and stuff like that. Uh, this is a very p good PR move in terms of that that uh, takes, how do you say, uh, that battles and combats the narrative that they're racist and that they're just there to adjudicate African leaders and stuff like that. Uh, the problematic thing is that if the ICC doesn't exist and if people are not willing to buy into that, usually there wouldn't be justice in some certain, some regards. So one of the examples is ICC prosecuted, the only sitting president that was prosecuted by uh, the ICC was Omar al-Bashir of Sudan. Uh, the problematic thing is, first of all, that he didn't accept the, how do you say, uh, didn't accept the, his conviction. And also other African countries didn't accept his conviction. So he was free, freely moving from all of the countries in the African Union. He went to China, he went to Russia. Nobody extradited them, even though ICC wanted them to extradite them. One of the possible reasons why that's true is that like he he is using that card. He is using that he's just prosecuted because he's black, because he's African, and because this is a racist institution that is just there to to, to do, do awful stuff to, to African countries and stuff like that. So that battle of perception is something that needs to change. Also, uh, Kenya, uh, in, in the, uh, Kenya, Congo, these are all the all the cases that were in the in the ICC and that, that were adjudicated by them. And a lot of, like a lot of convictions and a lot of protests that are happening is specifically because it's viewed as a racist institution. Interesting Separate point is uh, ICTY, which is like a subsidiary and it's in the same place, it's in the Hague, which is which was established by, uh, which is established tribunal by the crimes that happened in Yugoslav countries. The similar thing and similar arguments are happening here, which is that people do not accept what is happening there in adjudication, even, even because, first of all, they perceive it as biased. And secondly, they perceive it as imperialist. They perceive it that uh, this is not uneven justice. This is not a justice in terms of that the uh, U.S. is not answering for their crimes. Russia is not answering. Big countries can avoid justice, which is not very good if you want somebody to accept the adjudication. Why would you want somebody to accept the, the adjudication? That's something like that. Victims, reconciliation, and uh, like important processes that I cannot delve into that much in, in this workshop, but they're all tied to somebody not just being adjudicated and being convicted, but people accepting his conviction. So even if uh, war crimes have been, how do you say, uh, adjudicated in the ICTY and condemned, uh, the, if the Serbian, like if the Serbian people and Serbs do not accept that these people committed the war crimes, it doesn't do much for reconciliation. And one of the ways to make people uh, believe that this is not a, that, that to accept this adjudication is for them to believe that this is not a biased course, this is a court. This is not a court who's just adjudicating you because you're Serb, because you're African, because you're Croatian. We have songs about it also, which is very funny. So, uh, this, is, this, this, is the, the, this is the main problem of the, how do you say, ICC. Lots of people are, are fleeing and leaving, and this is something that needs to stop. So the debates that can happen is maybe African Union making their own alternative, alternative justice court. The problematic thing is, like I already said, uh, ICC, even if it's perceived like that, is not necessarily bad in and of itself. It's just unable to prosecute some of the people because either not state co state cooperation or the country is too huge and won't accept the, the thing that is that is happening to them. So not necessarily their fault. And the comparative justices 
be being judged by your peers, which is maybe not going to, which is, which is going to maybe prioritize other things than victims and the people that deserve our recognition uh, at, at, at most or something like that. So like the failure of African nations to condemn Omar al-Bashir is a very good example in terms of would this actually work and would this actually bring justice? And the debate would necessarily have to be in comparison. Where would this African nation be much more willing to cooperate, to concede the power, to uh, to actually accept the adjudication? Is it in the ICC or is it in their own alternatives? Alternative motions that also were presented was Belgrade Open Motion two years ago, which was that in retrospect, uh, instead of establishing icty international um, uh, so international court for the crimes in yugoslavia uh, there should have been a truth and reconciliation commission which is necessarily pioneered by uh, south africa and their reconciliation process which is necessarily a process where if you for uh, you have a deadline if you admit to your crimes and if you say where the bodies are buried what did you do admit you will get off scot-free, which is clear trade-off. These people will be free to go and will have, or either re they can also have reduced sentences. They won't be prosecuted um, but as, retrib as a retributive justice, but also you will have that plus of people actually admitting that they did something, which is also very important. And the whole debate would be what is more important to to victims? Is it more important for somebody to admit what they did before the whole world and not to negate their pain or for somebody to suffer in prison or, or something like that, which is a cool possible alternative and, and, and cool uh, possible motion, not just for Yugoslavia and for possible uh, different people. So other motions that are there uh, are necessarily trying to include more stuff under a mandate of the ICC. One of them is that the ICC should prosecute crimes, crimes against democracy. That was WUDC way, way earlier, where Sheng was there. So this basic motion is also about people opting into this system. If you increase this, you might increase justice and people wouldn't get prosecuted, but it might lead for, uh, to more countries actually leaving the ICC uh, because they fear they might get prosecuted. There is also a very good study that shows and tells that the existence of the ICC makes it uh, less likely for dictators to step down peacefully just because they fear prosecution of the ICC. So if they step down, they have additional, not just fear from their own people, they just fear that the international community is going to condemn them. So which is on the pragma pragmatic level, sure, they should like, answer for their crimes but the second pragmatic thing that should be taken into account is are we willing to pay for that justice in more years of this guy staying in power which is very bad in certain circumstances so just the fact that we are increasing the mandate or somewhat sometimes the existence of these people might lead to more di dictators holding on to power longer and not willing to seek power overall or something like that one more thing that I saw was that that they should ICC should uh, how do you say inc uh, adjudicate crimes against Earth. This is similar to universal jurisdiction. It's similar to an alternative to universal jurisdiction that was the finals of the Dutch worlds or stuff like that. But the point of this debate is also what the, will this make people more likely to opt out of this so even if you want and if you can adjudicate somebody if they do not want to accept this this call and if you are not willing to go in there by force by boots on the ground or something like that to enforce it you cannot really do anything and that's the the sad part about international law is that it's only in, as enforceable as people are willing to enforce it and as the, the larger states and the people who have the means are willing to enforce it. So if the African Union, United States are not willing to enforce all of these things, you can adjudicate all you want, you will accomplish nothing in this regard. And this is very important when you talk about international courts. People tend to glorify them or tend to, like people tend to have strong opinions on both ways and they're awesome or they're not like the 
the problematic, the most problematic thing is that it usually stuff does not work as people as it's intended as and as it is written on their websites or something like that. So do not listen to that. So two more things. One is universal jurisdiction as the uh, as the solution. Not just so universal jurisdiction can be a debate not just about the environment like we had in Dutch, but like can be also about crimes, genocide, and stuff like that. And it's already included in a lot of uh, how do you say uh, for a lot of crimes you can be prosecuted in different. So universal jurisdiction is even if you're even if something is not a crime in your own state, or you're committing a crime somewhere else where it's not a crime, or there the state is not willing to. Uh, I don't know, judge you on that ground, you can uh, be prosecuted in a different state. So, for example, pedophilia is criminalized everywhere. Even if you went to go to a country where it's legal and you return, you will still be prosecuted in your own country if they, if they found out about it and if they know. So you cannot get away from justice on a technicality that you weren't there uh, at the point. So some crimes are so severe that it warrants... Uh, universal jurisdiction. So the debates are not mostly going to be about this basic stuff, but should we increase this stuff towards the crimes against the environment, towards the war crimes, towards stuff like that, and holding up these people accountable by individual states. And usually the comparison will be with some other supranational institution, if you can possibly provide that it's much more working than universal jurisdiction. And that's the point. Third, uh, thirdly and fourthly, before I finish, because I think I have only less than 10 minutes left before my stream just goes blank. So thirdly, and if you have questions, obviously ask me and I will be uh, here or you can ask me afterwards. So thirdly, uh, ICJ or International Court of Justice, and like we're not, not anymore dealing with just the criminal criminal aspects but we're dealing with other disputes so where these disputes can happen not necessarily trade because there's other venues for that like wto but like stuff like about borders about uh, exclusive economic zones on the sea um, airspace and stuff like that this is something that is adjudicated on the icj again the problematic thing about icj is that if the country is not willing to accept the verdict and if the country is large enough for it to be able not to accept the verdict the verdict wouldn't be accepted and it's just a word on a piece of paper this is same with philippines versus china about the south china sea this was with uh, nicaragua versus nicaragua versus the united states where nicaragua won but they cannot enforce they're just not accepting that they're that they, they did stuff wrong so but the, the good point about it, even if it's not working for the largest actors, it's very good in terms of mediating the things between smaller actors that cannot really do this, how do you say, uh, cannot really completely opt out of the adjudication, which necessarily means that you're bringing stability and uh, conflict resolution to nations that wouldn't, uh, that would otherwise maybe go to through diplomacy, which is not necessarily reliable because you don't have a third party, or possibly conflict, tensions, war, or something like that. So it's very useful in that regard. There are not that many debates specifically about this. Usually they are targeted at poking China, poking US, and, and like maybe enforcing something, uh, some adjudication through there, which is really... <laughs> decently unrealistic to happen but like the usefulness of this institution is also in the fact like i said of people willing to opt into and choosing them as their arbiter and if you want to choose choose that these people are going to adjudicate you need to believe that these people are fair if you believe that these people are fair there is a merit then in them condemning china for for taking up territory or something like that even if it's not enforceable they're showing that they're willing to hold somebody accountable that is very huge, which means that people are made much more willing to come to them for their conflict resolution or something like that. So even if the motion doesn't per se mention and people start spewing that, oh, China will do something, not necessarily, the impacts of lots of these courts are much more grounded in if people believe that it's more fair, then that leads to uh, more justice in, in the world. 
lastly arbitration and this is very important in terms of uh, not just uh, like st like states solving their own issues state versus state state versus corporation state versus their own uh, versus citizen and citizen versus versus the corporation the arbitration and the main like briefly the main benefit of arbitration is the speed that it's being done so you're necessarily choosing and usually in clauses you choose your own arbiter you choose i want this person and you choose this person and third person and then these three or one or we agree they adjudicate what is the correct decision which necessarily means that we are uh, circumventing all the bureaucratic processes which means that it's faster why is it good it's good because faster means more secure investments which necessarily then means that if people are like usually when the, there is a dispute uh, in order not to lose profit if you're a maximizing profit type of company you want something to be resolved as quick as possible you, no matter the obviously you want your own outcome but no matter the outcome you want uh, to be settled uh, in the best possible manner so this is bringing them uh, that security, which necessarily means that it's lowering the cost of investment, lowering the cost of getting somebody a salary uh, in the association, which necessarily then facilitates, how do you say, uh, develop, uh, development or something like that. But like the negative side of arbitration, international arbitration, is that, I, and you shouldn't, I don't know, it's not that every uh, every call is adjudicated for the company or something like that, especially if you talk about uh, worker versus the company or something like that, which, which, is, which is very important. It's that in this proportionate amount of circumstances, it's being adjudicated for the company uh, in, in spite of that. Uh, it's not free for all. These people must follow certain contracts and they have the laws that they need to follow international arbitration and stuff like that. So it's not, but like they're leaning towards helping more of the people who are economically more solvent than, than a smaller guy or or smaller state versus a company this is where the isds talk when that i talked about in, in the beginning of the lecture comes into play and this is where labor labor disputes come into play like what you can also like an interesting fact like every product that you buy uh usually has a clause on on the back that says that you are ceding the right uh, if you want to sue that company to for it to must go to through the arbitration that's the standard of the contract that they're willing to do uh why is like and the case why is that true is that it makes bring certainty that first of all uh, laws will be upheld like neutrally and not by some country standard and secondly it brings speed which also brings even if it's maybe bad in some certain certain circumstances the decrease in in uh, like I'm going to say decreasing cost of investment means there's more likelihood of investment happening and also decreasing the labor cost means there is more salary to be paid to the workers. And this all costs of risk cost would be inserted into the payment and that wouldn't necessarily be good. So even if there are some negative side, these are the positive side. And I think you can come up with negative sides a lot on your side of the house, on your side of the house, on your, uh, uh, on your own. So I've rushed through some things. What I didn't talk about, like I said, I didn't talk about specifically about the European Union. I didn't talk about the UN because it's it's a separate topic and it's not as relevant. What I found about UN, usually UN is very unfunctional just by the fact that everybody is in there in terms of that they cannot make an agreement. There is a veto power. The debate that like and like this is important if somebody tries to put UN as an actor or if the intervention is happening. No, no, it's not. It shouldn't be the US. It should be UN. The problem is that it's very unrealistic for UN to react because it's comprised of everybody, and usually and the the how do you say the conflicts are between the countries. Uh, or something like that. So, so it depends on the will of the people to, to, to agree. But I didn't do, do not would not spend much more time on the UN because it's lots of people know about it. I much I would have much rather spend time on on these things that I spent. So thank you for listening. Hopefully this was useful. If you have any questions, I'll be here for like two minutes more.
and then I'll go and then you can ask me anything on Facebook basically or if you find me at any tournament and I'm happy to discuss a lot of these things Okay, if, if I didn't see the comment, I'm sorry, but it just doesn't show me anything. So if somebody commented that and I didn't see, I didn't ignore anything. I'm not censoring. I just didn't see anything. It just doesn't show anything. So anyway, I think that will be all. Thank you for listening and bye-bye.